Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Renee Garfinkel, your host on the New Books Network with the Van Leer Jerusalem series on ideas. We're always glad to hear from you. The email is vanleerideas at gmail.com. I'm pleased to welcome Michael Sandel to the show today to discuss his recent book, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good? Michael J. Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. His writings on justice, ethics, democracy, and markets have been translated into 27 languages and are aimed at taking philosophy out of the academy and into the public. He's been quite successful at that. China Newsweek named him the most influential foreign figure of the year. Michael Sandel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be with you. Before we get started talking about your book, tell us a bit about yourself. Was there a person, an event, or an idea that was notably influential in your intellectual development? Well, I came to philosophy relatively late, Renee. When I was growing up, I I was interested in politics. I was a political junkie going as, as a high school student and in through college, and I didn't know even when I graduated college what I wanted to to be when I grew up. I thought maybe I would go into politics, maybe be a political journalist. And I I, uh, had a few stints as a political journalist in through my college years and just after. And then when I went to graduate school, I found myself at Oxford and was doing graduate studies. I thought rather than continue studying only politics, political science, that I would study a little bit of philosophy just to fill in my background. And so I thought I could take care of that in a term or two, but I became hooked by philosophy and haven't quite emerged and found myself teaching and writing about moral and political philosophy. But I've always wanted to connect philosophy to the world to make it accessible and to enable it to inform the debates we have every day as democratic citizens. So I suppose that was my slightly winding journey to philosophy with a persisting interest in in making sense of politics. Well, that's quite a challenge, especially right now. Yeah. Uh, The premise of your book seems to assert that a society based on merit that is a society that rewards results and believes that hard work, individual initiative, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, is a society that does not value the common good, nor cares for those who can't succeed on their own. Is that what you believe? Well, uh, more or less, yes. And it's paradoxical on its face, because merit generally is a good thing. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. So merit, qualification in assigning jobs and social roles, that's a good thing. And it's also a good thing to remove barriers to success and achievement so that nobody is held back, so that everyone uh, should be free to exercise his or her uh, talents to the fullest. And yet, I write about the tyranny of merit. That's the title of the book. So how does merit become a kind of tyranny? I think it happens when, as we've seen in recent decades, the divide between winners and losers deepens. We've seen how this poisons our politics and drives us apart. It's partly about the deepening inequality, economic inequality of recent decades, But it's not only that. I think what's really created the polarization in our societies has to do with changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the deepening inequality. Those on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and by implication, that those who struggle, those who fall short, have no one to blame but themselves. It's this meritocratic hubris, the tendency of those on top to look down on those less successful, 
less credentialed than themselves, that gets to the tyranny of merit I'm writing about in the book, and that has created the anger and resentment, the sense of grievance that has led, I think, to the populist backlash against elites. Well, is that really something new? After all, the uh, the impoverished dairyman in Fiddler on the Roof lamented, when you're rich, they think you really know. And that was based on a 19th century short story. Right. So are we in this time period more likely to ascribe uh, uh, hubris to the rich and successful than previous generations? Well, you're right, of course. Renee, that those those on top in most every time and place that I know of have found a way of persuading themselves that they've earned it, that they've deserved that they deserve their place, and that those who struggle belong in their place too. This is not a new thought. So right. you're certainly right. I think what's made it different, what has intensified the meritocratic hubris of recent decades has to do with the role of higher education and the way in which by emphasizing, by rightly emphasizing education, but by emphasizing education, not only for its own sake, but as a a route to individual upward mobility, as a way of dealing with inequality, that's been at the heart of the problem. What we've really seen in our, if you look at our public discourse, and I track this in the book over the past four decades, is a growing emphasis on telling people the response to wage stagnation and inequality brought about by globalization is not to deal with that inequality directly as a structural problem of the economy, but to offer a way out, to offer a way up, and to tell people If you're worried about your place in the economy, if you're worried about stagnant wages, go to college, get a degree. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. This has been been a a kind of mantra uh, proclaimed by mainstream politicians across the political spectrum, Democrats and Republicans alike. And this is something new. We have created higher education as the gateway, as the arbiter of opportunity in a market-driven meritocratic society. And this has led us to assign honor and esteem to those with college credentials, those who have a university degree, preferably from a prestigious place. And this has had the effect of reinforcing the sense of hubris. I did it. I got the degree. I won admission to a prestigious place. And it's, it's led people who do not have a college degree to feel not only that their job prospects are diminished, but that the work they do is no longer respected. The dignity of work has been eroded by the valorization of credentialism. And that, I think, is distinctive to this period of, roughly speaking, of the last four decades, Renee. Well, well, you've been teaching in a very rarefied elite environment for some decades. Have you observed a change in your students' perspectives over that time in terms of entitlement and, if I could add to your ideas, what seems to me you're also saying hyper individualism well yes and no it's a it's a complicated uh, th- thing to read renee i would, uh, yes and no for the following reason in terms of commitment to public service uh, and uh, engagement in public service activities of various kinds uh, the students today the students i teach and and observe uh, are as engaged as any any generation that I can remember. So if by individualism you mean a lack of concern for public service, I would say no, 
that commitment is quite high, admirably high. What I do notice is a meritocratic conviction that their admission to a place like Harvard is largely the result of their own effort, their own strenuous effort and striving and hard work. This isn't individualism exactly, though it's something akin to individualism. And it's understandable how they come to view their own success at being admitted uh, in, in this way. And, and it points to one of the dark sides of meritocracy. The reason it's almost impossible not to view success at gaining admission to a highly competitive college as the result of one's own effort and striving is that these students growing up throughout their adolescent years and for some before have been subjected to tremendous pressures to achieve. We have converted the adolescent years of young people into a stress-strewn meritocratic gauntlet of striving, of competing, of extracurricular activities, of SAT prep courses, of enrichment activities the better to impress college admissions committees, of internships and good works in distant places to develop and fill out a resume that will be impressive. And the pressures on these young people are so intense that by the time they reach college, and here I'm talking about the winners, so-called, those who do win admission, by the time they arrive, many struggle with mental health challenges. We see among college students across the U.S. and Britain and Europe, very high levels of anxiety, of depression, of perfectionism, the, the sense of the need to, to please and to achieve, to please parents and teachers and counselors and admissions committees. And this, quite apart from the mental health challenge, the habit of hoop jumping, becomes so ingrained that it's difficult to find space to explore, to reflect on what's worth caring about and why, to figure out what's worth studying, what passions to pursue, because there's always another hoop to jump through. This I do see in my students, which is perhaps a, a roundabout way of answering your question, Rene, it isn't individualism exactly that's the problem, if you mean a selfish disregard for those uh, who, are for the less fortunate. It's not that. It's a sense that everything one has achieved is the result of one's own effort and hard work and striving. And this feeds the meritocratic hubris that actually coexists, can coexist, with this a public service orientation, paradoxically enough. So it's a complicated story, but it's one that, that reflects the deep imprint and the pressures that a, a highly competitive meritocratic society inflicts, even on the so-called winners, never mind the damage that it does to those who are excluded, who aren't equipped to compete, and who therefore uh, are consigned to jobs that are subject to the, the wage stagnation and the outsourcing that we've seen in recent decades. And along with, just to further complicate an already complicated <laughs> situation, along with the credentialism and the emphasis on education, uh, we all know and are constantly reminded of successful Americans who uh, did not have college degrees, uh, particularly in technology, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, Daniel Ek, who co-founded Spotify, Bill Gates, uh, but also in other fields. There's Ted Turner, a little bit in the past, um, 
the co-founder of Google, Larry Page. None of them graduated from college, although they did, most of them, if not all of them, they did get in. How does that leaven the uh, the view of credentialism? I, I don't think it does leaven the uh, the intensity of the meritocratic pressures. I think if you look at uh, some of the figures in Silicon Valley, whom you've mentioned, if anything, a meritocratic uh, a hubris is uh, well put it put it gently. It's it's by no means absent or unknown in Silicon <laughs> Valley, even yeah. among those who may have dropped out of Harvard to or or Stanford to um, create social media uh, giants. The the sentiment, the attitude towards success. Uh, I think persists, and the credentials come. Uh, Silicon Valley confers I- its own uh, kind of uh, credentials and and uh, practices its own kind of credentialism that is that is connected to uh, higher education, though not identical with it. But there, there's one other thing to to um, uh, be aware of about higher, the idea of higher education as an engine of upward mobility. Some uh, team of economists did a study and looked at, at uh, all of the colleges and universities, or some 1,800 colleges and universities in the United States, ranging from the highly selective places to places where one can be admitted Uh, to places that accept everyone who applies. And they found that overall, the percentage of students in American colleges and universities who come from a poor background and who rise to affluence, to the top fifth, is, what would you guess, 2%. Really? 2%. Wow. So it isn't really true that colleges and universities function as in- engines of upward mobility. This is not because, and it's even at places in the Ivy League, for example, it's less 1.5, 1.8% of students come from, from poor families, bottom fifth of the income scale, and rise to the top fifth. Now, why is this? It's not because a poor student who comes to Harvard is not likely to ex- to succeed and, and to rise. They typically uh, do and will. It's that there are so few students from poor backgrounds at these places to begin with that only a tiny fraction play out the success story we imagine of upward mobility where a poor kid gets into a good college and winds up uh, being affluent. You can think of it this way. Higher education in America is like an elevator that works very well, but an elevator in a building that most people enter on the top floor. So (laughs) it's a mistake to think that higher education is a powerful engine of upward mobility. And this is why, and here we, I suppose we begin to get into an alternative way of thinking about our society and about success. But what it suggests to me, and this is the, the general argument that I propose in, in the book, is that we should shift our focus from arming people for meritocratic combat and focus more on the dignity of work, on asking how we can make life better for everyone, regardless of their credentials, regardless of whether or not they attended a prestigious college or university. One of the things that you talk about, um, perhaps in that context, but certainly related to it, is the state of moral and civic education in America. Uh, first of all, what exactly do you mean by that? But also, at what point in, in school, at what ages, should that education take place? I think moral and civic education should 
begin early. Uh, I think it should take different forms uh, as students uh, advance in, in their education. Uh, let, let's begin with higher education. I think that colleges and universities should expose students to courses in ethical reasoning, in moral reasoning, in the history of political thought, and also in the ability to argue and reason together about hard ethical questions on which we often disagree. This, I think, is the civic skill, the democratic art of persuasion and being persuaded, of listening to one another, even where we disagree. This is the democratic art that has withered and that we desperately need. So I think that colleges and universities should provide a civic education and a moral education that emphasizes moral and political philosophy and the ability to engage with contemporary issues that raise philosophical questions and to reason about them effectively in public. Now, these skills can be developed earlier in the high school years. I think debating, I debated as a high school student and I loved it. And debating is not really an education in philosophy because when you're debating, you're trying to win an argument, not to find the truth. But I think for for high school students, it's a valuable form of civic education because it is a certain kind of training in persuasion with regard to public affairs. And it does require listening to arguments uh, with which one disagrees and responding effectively to them. But I think that in the earlier, I think civic education and moral education should begin even in primary uh, school, not in terms of philosophy, but through the use of imaginative literature and historical narrative to, uh, to, to expose even young students to stories, to narratives, be they literary narratives or historical narratives, that are rich with questions to discuss, questions about what's the right thing to do, questions about what's fair, about how this or that character should have acted, about how we should judge this or that historical figure or movement. So I would begin early, Renee, even in primary schools, with a narrative-based the kind of moral and civic education where students read compelling stories and discuss them and offer their views about them and where, where competing values are explored. Then more formalized kinds of debate into the high school years and then moral and political philosophy in, uh, in higher education in college and university. And I don't think we do this nearly well enough. And I think that the, the empty state of our current public discourse partly reflects that moral and civic education is woefully inadequate. Um, so I think that, that the educational system has an important role to play, but it can't do it alone. I think the media also has to provide forums for moral and civic discourse that go beyond the shouting matches to which we are relentlessly exposed in the name of political debate on cable television and talk radio and social media. So I think we have, uh, I, I think we have a, a daunting task in reviving the lost art of democratic public discourse. And that I think uh, our educational institutions and also the media and civil society have an important role to play in trying to pull us out of the dumbed down, hollowed out of shouting matches that pass for public discourse these days. I'm glad you mentioned uh, narratives. Um, you, you mentioned in the book uh, something called luck egalitarianism. And 
tell us about that and how it relates to the increasingly popular narratives of victimization that we hear from every corner. Like egalitarianism is a, a philosophy, a group of philosophers advanced the view during the 1980s and 90s that a just society is one that compensates people for bad luck, compensates people for misfortunes that are not, that, that are not their own doing, but that holds people responsible for everything else about their lot in life. That's the basic idea of luck egalitarianism. And the, uh, it seems generous in a way because it says people should not be, people should be helped if they suffer due to uh, factors that are no fault of their own. That seems generous. But there's a harsh side to the luck egalitarian philosophy which is that before we help people, before we consider there to be a public responsibility of support for our fellow citizens, especially those who struggle, we have to conduct a kind of inquiry to figure out, now, why exactly are you struggling? Why exactly are you without work or unable to feed your family? To what extent was it bad luck? And to what extent was, uh, could you have made choices in life that would not have landed you in this predicament? Now, it's understandable why philosophers and politicians would want to make that inquiry, because it seems to affirm the idea of individual responsibility for one's fate. But the harsh side that it expresses is connected to what I call the dark side of meritocracy. The dark side is that unless it can be shown that your struggles were nothing to do with your making, then we don't owe you anything. I think that's too, too narrow an idea of what we owe one another as, citizens, as fellow citizens, as fellow human beings. It's deeply at odds with the idea of solidarity or the sense of community that says we're all in this together. And some people struggle for lots of reasons, maybe having to do with the lives they've lived, the choices they've made, the talents they've been blessed with. But a decent society provides that everyone has decent access to health care, regardless of their ability to pay, access to a high quality education for themselves and their kids, regardless of their inability to pay, and regardless of the difficult circumstances that they find themselves in. So this is where luck egalitarianism, in a way, is a philosophical expression of the intensified meritocratic emphasis that uh, that we've experienced in recent decades. And if I could just add, Renee, one, one thing about what's distinctive, and this goes back to a question you put earlier, what's distinctive about meritocracy today? Meritocracy is a relatively recent term. It was coined in 1958 by a British sociologist, Michael Young. And when he coined the term meritocracy, he was not setting it out as an ideal, as a vision of a just society. He coined the term in describing a dystopia that he saw unfolding. The British class system was breaking down. This was a good thing. Children of the working class were increasingly having access to education and jobs. This too was a good thing. But Michael Young saw when he described meritocracy using the term for the first time, he saw that ultimately, if we created a society where everyone believed that the successful had earned their success, and that those who struggled deserved to have fallen short, that that would be a recipe for disharmony 
and for the erosion of any sense of community. He glimpsed this. And not only that, Rene, he predicted that by the year 2034, this was a kind of dystopian scenario he was writing, by 2034, he predicted a populist revolt against the meritocracy that would overthrow it. He and predicted that in 1958? Except it came 18 years ahead wow. of schedule. That is impressive. Oh, well, if, if uh, we're talking about perhaps changing our attitude toward and the functioning of higher education, especially in elite institutions, uh, this past year has uh, impacted those institutions as well as many others. Uh, how do you think the past year of remote learning uh, affected elite institutions? Do you think that people are rethinking its value and looking at alternatives or just waiting for it to end? I think mainly they're waiting for it to end. But I think the experience of remote learning and this past semester, all of, my, uh, all of the courses at Harvard were taught remotely, as was the case in many places. I think it is going to lead to a a blend, a kind of hybrid between in-person teaching and the use of online or produced uh, uh, components for teaching and learning. And some of this can be can lead to creative new possibilities. Um, but I think for the most part, people are just anxious to get back to in-person teaching and learning. And I'm, I'm of two minds about this. I'm, I've been engaged in, in experiments for a long time with trying to use new technology as a way of making um, education widely available and freely available. Before there were such things as MOOCs, these massive online courses, we did an experiment with my Harvard course on justice some years ago, and we filmed it and put it on public television and made it freely available online to anyone, anywhere who wanted to watch it, to take a course in moral and political philosophy. We, we never imagined uh, what the response would be. Never, I never dreamt that tens of millions of people would watch lectures about philosophy online. But that's what what's happened. So I'm a big believer in the use of new technologies as a way of opening access to the classroom, and maybe even also of, of creating platforms for global, global public discourse about subjects such as philosophy and moral and civic education, the areas in which I teach, and, and in other subjects as well. But I don't think that technology can ever replace the in-person relationship between uh, teachers and students. And so if we're to incorporate some of the experience of remote learning that we've had during this pandemic, I think it should be not to replace, but to supplement traditional forms of in-person learning. Finally, Michael, you urge people become more humble. You, your book promotes the value of humility, and it is, in fact, a revered characteristic, but one that's particularly hard to sell to America, a, a country where if one wants to be president, he or she has to spend two years traveling the country, asserting that out of 330 million, they are the best person to run the country. How do you envision changing this uniquely self-assertive society? Self-assertion can be a virtue, Rene, up to a point. <laughs> yes, that's true. But I think, I think we've reached and exceeded that point, not only with regard to presidential candidates. People who run for president historically have been ambitious people. But what's, what's happened in 
the last several decades is that attitudes towards success have changed in ways that we've been discussing across the society, not only among the political class, but among the professional classes um, and among the, 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 the credentialed classes, among those who have benefited most from the last four decades of market-driven globalization. I think, so what, what's the prospect of, of changing this or of being more reflective about it? Well, one opportunity, one possible opportunity for reconsidering the path that we're on may actually come from this experience of pandemic. In a way, the pandemic has revealed, highlighted in sharp relief, inequalities that were already present in our society. But those of us who had the luxury of working at home during the pandemic have come to realize, can't help but realize, how deeply we depend on workers we often overlook. Not only, I'm thinking not only of those in the hospitals caring for COVID patients, but I'm thinking also of of delivery workers, warehouse workers, grocery store clerks, home health care providers, child care workers. These are not the best paid or most honored workers in our society. But now we're calling them essential workers. And we are applauding them and we're putting up signs and banners thanking them. And all of this is a good thing, provided the sense of appreciation doesn't disappear when the pandemic recedes, this could be a moment for a broader public debate about how to bring their pay and recognition into better alignment with the work they do. The people we're calling essential workers now during the pandemic are not, for the most part, from the credential classes. Most do not have a four-year college degree, and yet we recognize how important is the work they do. So a political agenda focused on the dignity of work could take as its starting point this recognition. But you also ask, Renee, about humility. And this suggests that whatever we do in terms of reconfiguring the economy, the better to recognize and acknowledge the dignity of work. I think we also need a kind of moral and spiritual turning. And by we here, I'm speaking to the successful, to those who found their way one way or another to the top. Do, and, and that means asking certain questions of ourselves. Do I morally deserve the talents that enable me to flourish? Is it my doing that I live in a society that prizes the talents I happen to have? Or are these things my good luck? Insisting that my success is my due makes it hard to see myself in other people's shoes. But appreciating the role of luck in life, appreciating my sense of indebtedness to others who helped me on my way, can prompt a certain humility, can prompt the thought, looking at someone less fortunate, there, but for the accident of birth, or the grace of God, or the luck of the draw, go I. So this, this spirit of humility, which is in short supply these days, this is the civic virtue we need now. It, it can be the beginning of the way back, Rene, from the harsh ethic of success that drives us apart. And maybe just maybe it could point us toward a less rancorous, less polarized, more generous public life. Would it be? Well, Michael, I've enjoyed our conversation. You've given us a great deal to think about. Thank you for your important work and for being on the show today. Thank you, Renee. Thank you very much. And thanks to our researcher, Bela Pasikoff.